Uh, today we are presenting on object lock versus bucket lock. So uh, a quick why are we uh, in this market and what we believe is going to happen around unstructured data um, and, and why Cloudian's growth and um, the acceleration uh, of this market uh, is providing um, the opportunity um, that we all see to uh, really leverage this technology. So uh, over the last five years, certainly um, over the last couple, the, the rate of data growth in our personal lives, but also in the government and corporate world, has been accelerating the use of um, and the pervasive use of video and photos and voice recordings um, has made its way into corporate and government world and this unstructured data is really exploding. Um, and, uh, you know, whether that's from um, human data or sensor or business, um, this data uh, generally um, is difficult to manage and is generally um, uh, doesn't require the fast access to tier one data uh, and therefore the cost of it um, needs to be reduced um, over the next four to five years as well. Um, and that's the business that we're looking um, to help end users and partners with. So what, where we do fit and where we don't fit, um, so we're not looking and not looking to address that fast data where, where the traditional tier one uh, storage and, and platform companies um, uh, go after. Um, we, you know, we assume that most organisations would have their tier one data under control by now, whether that's on on-prem or an off-prem solution, we uh, so that that 20% and that's actually shrinking in terms of total data um, for database, virtual servers, and VDI. What we are really looking to um, address is the other 80%, the unstructured data, um, the object and file data um, that uh, that is really starting to become quite a difficult thing to manage um, because of its growth and its size and also a costly, um, a costly um, data to manage. Um, and it really doesn't require that fast data, uh, that, that, that block storage or fibre channel storage. Um, it requires Ethernet uh, and another way of looking after it. And um, the, the new um, um, way and the, the, since the pervasive use of cloud, um, vendors to survive in this marketplace really has to be automated and simplified. Um, and so to provide that cloud-like experience um, at a lower cost is really uh, the aim for our solution um, and, and the value that we can bring to the marketplace. Um, and there's a number of use cases that, uh, that we, we would address and we, we've, we've been over those the last couple of um, webinars. Um, but really, it's around um, that tier two and tier three data, that that voice, um, audio, um, and the uh, you know, the unstructured data um, with object and file. So, um, without further ado, I'll probably pass over to Jason at this point. Today, we wanted to address um, a very um, topical. Uh, conversation around ransomware um, and the issues around ransomware and get to the crux of um, what the value of um, file or, or um, bucket lot um, would present. And we thought, you know, that most vendors and most organisations are, are saying that we're a me too, that we can do this and that, that uh, you know, that, uh, you know, we've been doing it forever. Well, we're going to, Jason's going to get to the crux of um what uh, what the, some of the FUD might be out there in the market around this topic. So without further ado, I'll pass over to Jason. Um, but please, as I said, uh, provide feedback, give us uh, some questions to answer um, and, uh, and watch out for those uh, polls that we do um, during, during the webinar. Thanks very much and I'll pass over to Jason. Um, so really the topic of conversation today, we were talking about bucket lock versus object lock. Uh, both technologies really stem out of this capability that we all may know or may not know of write once, read many, which has been very popular in our industry at different times. It's certainly not a new concept and it's certainly not the game from 1996. Uh, those of you old enough to remember that will remember the, the little worm fodder that we all played with, but worms today that we'll be discussing is really around um, you know, protecting data at rest, being able to read it multiple times but not overwrite or change it. So 
With the advent of optical drives and media types that weren't well suited to being rewritten again, uh, this was kind of implied. But certainly over, over the journey, many manufacturers and many uh, software companies have tried to provide worms capabilities with, with the aspect of running it on a read-write type media, so hard drives and other mechanisms like tapes. More, more recently, what we've seen from the hyperscale cloud providers is the ability to alpha that in the public cloud. Um, as well as on-premise through a number of other um, solution providers. But um, what we're seeing is a, is a sort of a market-leading approach being taken by the likes of AWS to actually introduce new capabilities into this Worms um, portfolio where you can lock an object, a single object or a single file um, at rest on storage. And that has numerous benefits, um, but we'll go through both, uh, both the bucket and the object lock stuff today. We'll also talk a little bit about some of the use cases James has already alluded to, um, the prevalence of things like ransomware, people being more and more concerned about malicious actors, either externally in their businesses or internally in their businesses. Um, maliciously damaging or deleting data is a real problem. Um, and so object lock together with um, worms is a way of either protecting yourself from ransomware or providing unique benefits like legal hold. Um, you know, so if you've been required for any legal reason to hold on to data, using these functionalities in, in, this, in these solutions allows you to do that. <coughs> so, you know, the first one that we will talk about is ransomware. So um, this is a report from Forrester, which um, we didn't make it into the attachments. I couldn't find it at short notice, um, but I'm happy to, if anyone emails me, send, um, send a link to this report. You can also find it on our website. Um, effectively, Forrester did a, a bit of a, a review and, and found that, and you can see in the capture, here, implementing an immutable file system with underlying worm storage will make a file system watertight from a ransomware protection perspective. So what this is talking about is that once you, you know, your data protection workflows have gone through and backed up your data and made an index of it and either put it onto a secondary system or somewhere else in your environment, not protecting them leaves you wide open to a ransomware attack coming in and basically destroying those backup copies. The more sophisticated these mechanisms become, the more sophisticated they become at intruding, um, identifying data in your network, locking it, and then actually not locking it until they know that you know, a snapshot uh, or a backup window might have expired. So these software solutions now that um, are being used by ransomware attackers are actually sophisticated enough to wait seven or 30 days um, and in fact blow up all of your backups in the process. So what Forrester did in this report, he said if you can make those um, worms, make them read once, write, uh, write once, read many, you can effectively shutter that, um, that attack surface in your environment. Um, apart from that uh, as well, we also needed to make sure that whatever solutions we provided to market for either you know, legal hold or for compliance around um, uh, ransomware protection, we needed to make sure that they were um, not only immutable at rest, but also um, immutable and couldn't be changed even by someone that had administrative access to the system. So um, Cloudian went out with the assistance of Coasset Associates and, and basically commissioned a report. And this report is in the attached link, so I'd advise you to download it if you want to have a quick read. Um, and effectively checked it against three major um, security um, requirements out of the US. So uh, SEC Rule 17A4F and CFTC Rule 1.31. Effectively, the guts of these is that they wanted to make sure that if the data was stored, it couldn't be changed and it couldn't be changed by an administrator. Um, and as part of that, we also added key functionality to our product uh, solution, uh, to our product to, to make this a viable solution. So we'll go into that in a little bit more detail, but like I said, the report is in the, uh, the attachments, so definitely jump on and have a look at that. But really what we're saying is object lock, bucket lock, any sort of worms capability, you can't have one without the other probably more dangerous to set the expectation in your business that you're able to protect this information if you're not able to protect it even from administrators who might act maliciously um, on that data set. So sort of a quite high level overview, um, certainly some of the conversations we had with customers um, and some of the things they may have encountered themselves is when, when considering a worms policy for their business or for their application set, um, what are some of the things they might need to consider and where would bucket versus object fit and not fit? Um, bucket, you know, as a first starting point, is a good catch-all. You can enable a worms policy on a bucket and have certainty that anything that's written into that is going to be very broadly protected for a period of time. So if you had a, a bucket on Thadium and that bucket had a, a preset um, rule to basically apply for 30 days, everything's being created in that bucket, you, you, it's kind of a no-touch approach. Um, but you are enabling that 
bucket approach to define retention on an ingest of a single item for a different schedule. So for most solutions that aren't cloudy, and if you wanted to say put everything in the bucket for 30 days, but then one thing goes into the bucket that you want to put in for 60 days, that's not possible with that bucket approach. Um, all objects inherit the same policy for the same period, which means that it, you know, it's a rolling approach. So if the first object goes in on Thursday, it goes in for 30 days. The second one goes in for, on Friday, it goes in for 30 days. The third one goes in, it goes in for 30 days. You certainly can't terminate them at the same time. You couldn't make one 30, the other one 29, the other one 28 to get them to align because of that, that broad approach of um, the policy at the bucket level. So on Cloudian, um, you can do that, or you can also on Cloudian, which we've worked really closely with AWS around, lock it down to a single object. And so the, the object approach is a very efficient use of storage. Um, imagine that you have petabytes of information on your platform or petabytes of information in the bucket, but you really only want to protect a couple of hundred gigabytes or terabytes of that data. Object lock allows you to set fine-grained policy on that specific item. Each object has its own individual retention schedule. So, you know, to use that same example, Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they all go in. They can all be matched together if need be. Um, to get to the exact um, retention that's required. And you're able to age out objects in a, in a bucket at, at different times. So you can have a bucket that contains stuff that's been retained for 100 years, stuff that's been retained for 60 days. In the other solution, you'd need to have a bucket for, you know, if you wanted to apply that policy, you'd have to have the bucket for 60, a bucket for 90, a bucket for 100 days. You'd have to have buckets for different policies. Um, with object level locking, you can define those policies on the file. Um, and it can be defined after creation as well with an object. So it could go into the container or it, the, the object could go into the bucket and in fact have no level of object protection attached to it and then actually be applied retrospectively, which is a nice feature. Um, and the other really cool thing is that with object level locking, and this is certainly what we're seeing in the market, a trend towards using these key APIs, is the ability to apply it using third-party applications. So the example I've got here is Veeam. Um, but really that takes the administrator, the, you know, the manual processes really out of the flow of the data, the data pipeline. You know, in, that in, in that example, you could back up your data with Veeam, create a secondary copy somewhere, and then when you tear it out to your uh, Cloudian um, object store, you can define in the application, inside of Veeam directly, how long you want to make that data immutable before at rest. So you get a, a really nice sort of chain of custody, if you like, that, that complements each other from the, you know, the creation of the initial backup copy right through to the archive copy as well. So I'll just pause there for a second if there's any questions. No? Okay. So the good news is Cloudium provides both. So we're not asking you, so I mean, we're a little bit um, cheeky in the, the way we've positioned this this session, you know, bucket versus object, one versus the other. The great news is with Cloudian, you can pick whichever one is best fitted to your application um, at the time. You can mix and match, um, and you can certainly, like I said, have one um, in one bucket and, and none in another and use the object level locking on the other one. So we're not asking you to choose. When you choose Cloudian, we're asking you to basically understand the, the benefits of both and pick one which is most appropriate for you. All right, good question. All right, let me just repeat this. When retrieving data when it has been stored by the Cloudian object solution, even if you have had a security breach, you will never lose the data. Uh, correct. If it's marked as immutable at rest, there's no reason that data can be um, deleted or modified in any way, including by the administrator. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in more detail now. So cloudy and object lock, let's sort of drill down now into the way in which we configure this um, at a low level on our system. So for an object lock enabled bucket, we set a bucket default object lock configuration, which will apply to all objects that are subsequently created in that bucket. The object lock policy config specifies the retention time period that will be applied to those objects and subsequently created. Each object's retention period starts when the object's entering the bucket. Pretty straightforward. The only choice you have at that point is whether or not you want to use governance mode or compliance mode. So governance mode allows privileged users to, to be able to change the retention period post creation or delete the object before the retention period completes, whereas compliance does not allow any user at all, even the administrator, to make those changes. So that, that, that's a key differentiator right there. If you've created those, those copies, 
Um, you may want to do it as a soft creation, and in which case you could use governance mode. If you wanted to create those copies, then make sure that no one can change them. In that instance, you would use compliance. And, and these, all of these features work in, in concert with everything else in the system. So the redundancy and the durability, the protection across sites, um, the ability to create multiple copies to protect you from any single node or you know, drive or device failure. All of that still works underneath the covers. There's no caveats where we say, oh, well, you can have object lock, but you can't have the, the durability. Everything maintains its capability and function underneath. This just gives you extra, uh, extra um, controls for protecting that information. So that's effectively the way we would do it for bucket lock. If I just go to the next screen. Um, this is where we would look at um, lock attributes on an individual object. So this is the um, object lock capability. And this can either be driven by the S3 endpoint when it creates the data in the object store, or the object can be touched after the fact and actually modified to, to suit. So the object lock set on an object can be either one or both. So you can set retention in the same way that you could on a bucket. You can have governance or compliance mode. Um, but there's also one extra feature, and this is part of the AWS S3 specification for, for object lock, and that's the legal hold, so, which implies for an indefinite period or until explicitly released. So the key thing that's different here is that whereby with a bucket, you would be able to say, you know, keep my data for 60 days, keep my data for 120 days. Um, you know, there's no way you can extend that for any reason. Using object lock, you could have a, a default you know, policy that when the data was placed into the object store, that it was kept for 60 or 90 or 120 days. But if someone marks it as legal hold, that now actually overwrites or over, overrides the previous retention mechanism and will now keep it forever. So we've got another question. Is the bucket or object lock applied to the replicated data within Cloudian automatically? Um, yes. So all of the features that we're talking about here happen well before the data is protected and duplicated at a Cloudian um, storage level. So none of them, none of them um, are ever missed. If you protect something with a bu in a bucket protection or an object lock protection, all of that protection is applied in metadata before it gets copied down to the storage. Um, so all of that stuff is preserved. Thanks for the question. Um, so yeah, just to, just to summarize, Retention, governance, or compliance mode, that legal hold allows you within a single object to actually extend that retention either indefinitely um, so that it can't be deleted. Um, you can go back and remove that legal hold, um, but you wouldn't be able to modify the object. So these are per object level um, considerations, which I think, like I said earlier, should be considered as like maybe sometimes bucket is the right fit, but oftentimes if you can define that end-to-end -end capability with something like Veeam or a backup product, then you're getting a full airtight you know, level of protection. You know that once it's created a copy, it's going to move it into the object store and it's going to protect it with these features, not leaving it up to human interaction. So a key part, as I alluded to earlier, and with the co-ed assets um, and associates document we've shared with you today, none of this would be possible without it being able to um, make the platform hypersore that our system stores the objects in secure. So worms without validated protection, as I said earlier, is probably worse with no protection at all because your false sense of security that your data is immutable and that no one can delete it could be easily shattered by someone coming in with, a, with administrative access and deleting those objects. On a Cloudium system, you must first enable what we call our hyperstore shell. That's a security um, capability built into our product that hardens the system, including things like firewalls, deletes root privilege access on the system, um, effectively makes it impossible to, to, um, to um, con uh, configure or um, maliciously damage the system in any way. And it applies equally to our appliances and to software and solutions as well. The system will not allow the creation of object lock enabled buckets until this feature is turned on. So there's no way that you can basically get a whole bunch of data being created immutably on the platform and then forget, oh, whoops, we forgot to enable HSH. HSH is an absolute requirement, and it's a key part of our strategy with, re with respect to worms. Um, each HSH administrator must have a unique login, which is very good practice, but it will be enforced. And commands that administrators can execute will be limited so that they can't damage the system. And all users are prevented from deleting or changing objects in compliance or legal hold. 
So that's, you know, again, it's one thing to say you can do it. It's one thing to make sure that there is zero chance that it can be damaged anyway. Um, and then the final piece is that all admin and user actions are always recorded in an audit log. So security guys will love it if you're able to, you know, define logs that can capture and audit all the stuff that their users are doing on the system. Um, again, it's one thing to be able to lock half of it down or make the file immutable, but if you can't provide the full security conversation around it, it's kind of useless. Got another question here. So also being able to use file lock instead of bucket lock, does file lock save you money over file lock? Um, I'd say it makes for a more efficient use of storage. If, if your end goal is to only protect a small subset of items in your um, object store, Making them all immutable means that if, let's say you make 100 terabytes immutable for 30 days and then you need to create another 100 terabytes, you're going to need another 100 terabytes of space. If you had 100 terabytes of data and you needed to protect just a small subset, say 100 gigabytes or 100 terabytes, uh, sorry, 100 gigabytes that 100 terabytes, then that 100 gigabytes would be protected and you'd only need another 100 gigabytes of space if you wanted to create new copies of that data. So I wouldn't think of it as, I mean, it's not saving you money. They both are included with the solution. They both um, are the same. They're both, you know, both of them come with clouding. Um, one's not cheaper than the other or more expensive than the other, but certainly from a storage efficiency perspective, not locking everything um, redundantly would save you on space. Thanks for the question. So a bit of a report card. Um, you know, these... You know, in the, as we alluded to at the start, you know, these are features that everyone says they can do. Everyone says, oh, yeah, we do worms. Um, and then in preparation for this and for a few other things we've been researching, I've gone on and had a look at all the user documentation for some of our um, bigger competitors. So object lock, tick for CloudN, simple, um, simple and easy to apply because we can apply it either at the bucket or at the object level. Um, certified compliance. We've gone out and had a third party evaluate our solution and make sure that whatever we say we're creating immutable copies of can't be damaged or changed in any way. And, and it works on scale out x86 physically or virtually. So we're not requiring a Cloudian that you buy a big expensive Cloudian box and, and use that. Our solution and our capabilities around bucket and object lock with worms work seamlessly across both physical and virtual infrastructure as well as on any of our OEM platforms. Um, as well as our appliances. So before I get into the red checkboxes for our competitors, I mean, these are some of the things that you find in the user documentation. If object level retention period is assigned and the application level do not use XXX, i.e. the product feature, to assign a retention period greater than the application period. Retention period. This may lead to application errors. Uh, I don't know about you guys, but the last thing I want to use in the user guide is that I'm going to create errors by just simply trying to um, change a retention period on an object. And probably my favorite one was setting delete object to deny in an S3 policy does not prevent XXX product from deleting objects when rules such as zero copies after 30 days exist. I mean, you can't make this stuff up. Effectively, what that's saying is if you have a policy to retain data for 60 days and you've got another policy saying delete copies after 30, the delete copies after 30 will override the one about protecting your data. Um, and so that's why in this report card, we've given them such a bad rating. Um, do they do object level locking? Neither of them do. Are they simple? Well, not really, because you need to read the install guide, otherwise you won't have any idea what it's doing. Have they been independently validated? No, they haven't. And do they run on any x86 hardware physically or virtually? No, they don't. Um, so, I mean, that's just two of our competitors in the space. Um, I'm sure if we wanted to go and make a longer list, we probably could have. Um, but but Cladian ticks all the boxes in terms of the functionality that's required to have a, a great Worms implementation. One more question uh, on here, so I'll repeat the question. As more and more data is diff and different types of media that needs to be secured, does Object Lock secure those files? Um, so we don't... We don't um, there's two parts to this question, I'll just answer the first one. So as more and more data uh, with different types of media is created, uh, do we well, just lock those files? So any file that is created in either in a bucket or with the policy attached to it when it's created at an object lock level is protected. Whether it's a video, it doesn't matter whether it's a PDF, whether it's an image, any document that is placed in a bucket with a bucket lock policy would be protected. If the object is uploaded into the S3 bucket with the S3 command to append a retention period, it's protected. Um, with cloud in object storage, the ingress and egress of moving your data has less impact on the network. Um, so certainly if your private 
uh, on-premise um, cloud in solution is deployed inside of your network, um, you will definitely not be paying any ingress and ingress costs, um, but it, it should have no bearing on um, making it immutable. All right, is the bucket or object lock applied to the replicated data within cloud in automatically, or will the admin need to manually set these via the console? So bucket and object lock are applied to the replicated data automatically, and no, the administrator, administrator does not need to set these manually via the console. As more and more data, and okay, so I think we've got the same question repeated here. Yeah, I think we've got answered that. Okay, moving right along. So just a quick recap, um, and I did, I'd really strongly suggest anyone that's um, joined today that's missed the first couple of webinars. Um, we have not spent time dwelling on the, you know, the full breadth of solutions that we have here at CloudIn. Um, but just as a recap, I would advise, I would just really strongly recommend go back and have a look at the first webinar that James and I did. Um, in that, we unpack more about HyperStore as an object storage platform, the way in which you can deploy it, the use cases for its use. Um, and we also touch on Hyperfile. So Hyperstore, together with Hyperfile, gives you an option for your environment, together with, with our Worms capability, to be able to provide either SIS or NFS files and folders as alongside AWS S3 compatible objects and buckets with tiering capabilities. So last week we talked ex exclusively about auto tiering um, with the ability to auto tier that data out to the cloud. So I'd, I'd really recommend if you missed that or if you've got any questions that we haven't covered today, um, go back and have a look at those two recordings. You can get to them by, um, by using the schedule in the attachments. Uh, and then finally, we'll just go through sort of the, the so what of S3. So, you know, the so what of S3 and the great job that AWS has done in creating this, this amazing standard is that many, many businesses, many businesses that you know or many businesses that you already work with have taken steps to, uh, to integrate their solutions into the S3 ecosystem. So on the left here, we see our featured partnered solutions. Um, so companies like Combolt and others where we've done um, extensive testing and work to design joint solutions that mean that you can take copies of those data off those platforms and move it natively with S3 into our platform. Um, the broader ecosystem is one that is basically driven by AWS themselves. AWS does such a great job that all of these companies have jumped on board to make their products compatible with S3, um, and this continues to grow every day. And so the kind of so what of this is that we absolutely would recommend cloud in an environment where you want that S3 capability to be as close to the cloud as possible. We have the most complete set of features as evidenced here by the fact that we're the first market with object lock. But we, we work really closely and really, um, really um, hard to make sure that when these new features are announced, we have them in our platform very soon after. And finally, just some sort of quick recaps around um, not only providing the most complete private cloud S3 solution, but some of the other features and benefits. 100% native S3 API, so it's built right into the product. It runs on every node in the solution. It's robust, it's reliable, and as you scale the system, it gets faster and more capable. Multi-tenancy with QoS and billing is built right into the platform, as is our policy-based data protection. Any, any way you protect data, whether it be through redundant copies or through our erasure coding, all of that works seamlessly with Worms and the capabilities we've introduced today. Um, Gartner Peer Insights has recognized us as a leader in this space. Um, just, this, just this year, we won the, the, the award for the most recommended um, object storage solution on, on the Peer Insights platform. Policy-based tiering to cloud, as I alluded to in the last week's presentation, we talked a bit about this at length. Being able to move based on um, policy data from an on-prem S3 store into either Azure, into Microsoft, or, uh, sorry, into GCP or into AWS. One file system solution for files and objects, so that's Hyperfile and, um, and the Hyperstore capability. I should point out that when you buy Hyperstore, you get Hyper, the Hyperfile bit for free, up to the capacity that you're licensed for. So that's why it's that one system. We're not asking you to put your hand in your pocket and buy another one. Uh, up to 14 nines of data durability. So if you've got a data set that really needs to be protected, we can genuinely come up with a solution that'll provide the durability you need, either across multiple sites or by just providing multiple nodes in a single site. And probably the thing that I think is gonna make a lot more sense and it's our final call to action um, on this slide is store more, pay less. Six ways you can save with object storage. I'd, I'd really encourage you guys to have a look at the links that's attached. In that is a, an infographic. 
And in that is the six ways you can save, st uh, save money with object storage. Um, and if you click on each one of them, you can go to the website and see a little bit more detail. The really thing I'd leave you here with, um, with this is that, um, as we said, we're looking for 80% of the capacity data of the world to help customers solve that challenge. When you have lots of unstructured data, you know, the, the, the value of that data is different to the value of tier one data with database. So you need to make the economics of it half a cent or less per gigabyte per month. Otherwise, storing petabytes and petabytes of information just doesn't work. So if you need anything further, obviously we've got our contact details there. More than happy to run individual uh, Zoom meetings, um, have conversation and go further in depth into some of the features. Um, stick with us in, in the webinar series as we, we cover the appropriate topics that you're interested in and uh, we, we appreciate you, you listening. Thanks very much. Thanks for your time. Thanks everyone.